While most retired NBA players spend their post-NBA years relaxing or on the golf course, this recently retired athletic superstar has redefined retirement. As a New York Times best-selling author, TNT sports analyst, entrepreneur, executive producer, production company owner, and fashion icon, he is running more plays off the court than on. Welcome to the Blueprint Men's Summit, three-time NBA champion, Dwayne Wade. Dwayne, you grew up on the south side of Chicago in neighborhoods that most people would call challenging at best. Looking back, do you think those challenges were a motivator or a hindrance for your success? Hmm, that's a great question. Um, personally, for me, Lewis, I, they motivated me. Um, you know, and I, I think more so than even even growing up in the inner city of Chicago, it was how my family was growing up in Chicago that motivated me. You know, I was a kid and I knew what I knew, you know, but I was able to watch my family and I was able to watch, you know, the, um, the addictions that my mom was going through, the addictions that my father was going through. Uh, the in and out of jail of a lot of my a lot of my family and then eventually some of my peers and I just didn't want that you know I didn't want that life so it motivated me to want different and 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 I, I took to basketball um, because basketball was you know what I what I love but basketball was the thing that I felt could help me become different or you know make sure that my family have different so 100 for me it was a motivation. Um, but I can also see how it can be a hindrance to, to some, you know, at the same time. Like, you know, I, I was one of the lucky ones that even though it seemed like it, it was a long, a, a long path to get there, I was 21 years old when I made it to the NBA. You know, you got some people who in life, normally not successful by the standards of life until you're in your 40s. And so if you're trying to become successful and you're in the hood and you're growing up in, in the city and it takes you until you're 40, well, it may be hard to just to keep fighting and to keep pushing and to keep going. Um, you know, at some point you may give up if you feel that you're not given given or getting the opportunities um, that you feel you deserve. How important was vision on your journey towards success? Did you have your own vision, or did you run into people that help you develop your vision? Those people I call vision makers. <laughs> my, my talent is just seeing my vision. Uh, speaking it into existence. You know, my sister, you know, as a young kid, my sister always told me to ask for what I want. You know, every night before I went to bed, we made through in our prayers that I asked for what I wanted. And I did that. And I believe in it. I believe in the power of putting it in the universe. I believe in the power of saying it out loud. So one, you can hear it, what you're trying to accomplish, who you want to be, where you want to go. And it makes you want to accomplish it. It makes you not want to cheat yourself to accomplish it. So, my, without vision, without dreams, I'm not, I'm not sitting here with you right now. I'm, I haven't accomplished anything in my life if I didn't have you. We all had ordinary people who did some extraordinary things in our lives that changed us forever. Who are some of those people for you? Hmm. Um, you know, I look no further than was in my, in my family. Right? I, look, I look no further than my mother. You know, and, I, and I've said this, is, you know, and my story about my childhood has, has been documented. Um, I've done documentaries more than one talking about my mother being addicted to heroin, addicted to cocaine and crack and, you know, being in jail for the majority of my life. But to watch this woman, uh, you know, get herself really hurt. She didn't go to rehab. You know, she, really, she, she got herself off of drugs to watch her turn into a pastor. Uh, to watch her start changing lives of others along this journey. Um, and, and just as a young kid, Louis, you know, I, I sat right here just like I'm sitting with you, and I watched my mom, you know, go in and out. I watched my mom shoot up with drugs, and she didn't know that I was seeing her. And for me at that time, it was nothing that, that I felt that I could go through that would hurt my heart as much as that or would be hard as that, you know, as a young kid. And so I look at my mother, and I always looked at my mother as someone who was just strong, man, like – the things that I go through, the injuries that I've had, the ups and downs that I've had, it, it, it's nothing compared to what that woman went through. And um, so I look no further than my family for motivation. You have been named as one of Time's top 100 influential people of the year. Tell us what influence means to you and how do you use it? Mm, it's a great question. Uh, first of all, that was an amazing honor. You know, I think 
influence is you know, been in a been in a position to uh, to speak on um, to show an example of um, of of issues and things that other people are going through. You know, that's all I've done. I've I've spoken on issues that I know not only my family my family's going through, but also other families are going through. You know, I've spoken on our family, uh, me and my wife going through surgery. We spoke on my my daughter's um, you know transition and and into uh, from what everyone had known her to be with Zion to now Zion and to coming into a young lady and you know entering the LGBTQ plus community. And we spoken on how we support our family, how we love our family. And if that's if that's influence, if that's influential, um, that's just me being a, a a parent. That's just me being a, a human in this world is making sure that, you know, I always evolve and I understand that what I learned as a kid is not going to be the way the life, the way the world is going to be. You have to evolve. You have to change. You have to adjust yourself um, as you continue to keep living because the, that's what the world does. The world continues to evolve. You were one of the top NBA players of our time. What was the driving force that kept you in the game and at the top of the game for so long? You know what, I man? If we don't reinvent ourselves, if we don't once again evolve, we don't get left behind. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, you know, playing in the NBA, you see over the course of time that the game changes. You know, when I first came into, into the NBA, it was you had to have a shooting guard, then you had to have a big man. You come down, you throw the ball in the post, you let Shaq, you let the big guys go to work. And then eventually start changing to where it was about picking roles. And then it started changing to where it was about getting off the ball and, you know, just a lot of different, the game evolved. And so if I didn't reinvent myself when I played with Shaq compared to when I played with LeBron, compared to when I was a star on the team by myself, if I didn't always reinvent myself, then at some point they would have moved on and they would have found someone who can accomplish and do the things they needed. So if you want to have a job, <laughs> you know, if you want to continue to play and continue to live your dream out, you have to reinvent yourself, not only in the NBA, but in life, if you want to continue to keep evolving and changing. You are a superstar who's had not only ups during your journey, but you've also had some downs. How did you get through those tough times? Yeah, first of all, thank you for that. Um, for me, you know, I just feel like the, the, the good times, the great times, the, the times where things feel like it's going easy, yeah, that's great. You know, we all love that. But the times where it's hard, the times where people doubt you, the times when you doubt yourself, those are the moments where you grow. Those are the moments where you really dig deep down inside and you really find out who you really are and what you're really about. And so I would tell, you know, all the, the, the younger generation, and I just like I tell my son is, you're going to go through highs, you're going to go through lows. Like, that's life. Life is an ebb and flow. You know, the character of who you are is how you deal with uh, things when you're going through those lows. And once you get to that high, you know, how you can continue to elevate uh, others and, and bring them along and share those lows with them because everyone goes through it. And that's all I've tried to do, Lou. I've tried to share my, my lows and I've tried to share people in my highs because I want people to be motivated and inspired by, you know, someone's out here that's doing it and is not afraid to talk about it. 2020 is the first time in history that we've seen professional sports leagues, players, coaches, owners take organized action and stand in support of social equality and social equity. What do you think was the tipping point? And will this become the norm forever? Yeah. You know, I, I think the, the NBA has done an amazing job of actually listening, listening to that play. And when, when we were in negotiations, the argument, you know, from both sides, was, this is a partnership. You know, this is a 50-50 partnership. If this is a partnership, if it's 50-50, then it shouldn't be just one voice. Um, and so the NBA has done an amazing job of listening to their players. That's why the things that, you know, Chris Paul fought for, the NBPA fought for, um, you know, with going into the bubble was accomplished. You know, what I loved about that is I love the fact that not only did LeBron James and not only did uh, Chris Paul and these, these, these bigger name players have their voice, but each player on the roster got a chance to talk about what's important to them. Everybody, you know, in their communities, the people from their community got a chance to see them stand up and stand out and their voices was on, you know, the biggest stage. So is this the future? 
I hope it is. I hope that athletes, I hope that not only just athletes, I hope that people in our, in our world that we live in understand that um, to get things accomplished, you have to apply pressure. If you don't apply pressure, nothing will get accomplished. And in our community, Lou, we need to, we need change. We need to continue to see growth. Right now in our world, we took, we've taken so many steps backwards. And, you know, for us to get to where we're trying to get to, if our voices is not heard, if our actions is not seen, then nothing will be changed. Dwayne, you keep reinventing yourself over and over and over again. In your opinion, how important is it for men to recreate themselves? Um, it's, it's, it's very important, man. You know, I, I, um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm definitely blessed and I'm definitely, I've been in, in a situation that I've taken advantage of and, you know, and it has allowed me to be in a position where I'm able to keep reinventing myself and continue to keep, uh, but in the midst of reinventing myself, I haven't been perfect along the way. And so not only have my family and my loved ones and, but, my fans and my supporters have allowed me to be in a public eye and fall and then get back up. And I think, you know, as a black, as a man, not even a black man, but just a man period, but especially as a black man, we, we don't, we, we feel like we're, we, we have to be mighty. We don't feel like we should ever fall. We don't feel like we should, we, we can make mistakes because we're going to be looked at as a certain way or less than I'm, I'm, the, I'm here to tell people that the only way you learn is by making mistakes. And in, and that's what I tell my son all the time. So, you know, my whole part, my whole thing through this life that people have been knowing me for the last 20 years is just about this evolution, this, this growth and understanding that I don't know everything. If I don't know everything, let me find the people that do know the things that I don't know. <laughs> let me make sure I team up with them and, and then bring my strengths with their strengths and let's make something together. So for me, it's about letting go of your pride a little bit. You know, it's about, you know, uh, making sure that everybody around you and, and everybody that's, that, that comes into your space understands that, you know, you are, you're doing it for the right reason. And it's not a selfish reason. Like for me, everything I do is bigger than me. Um, it's not about just me. It's about my family. It's about my community and how I can affect and change those things. What do you tell your children about being black in America? Oof, man, those are some of the hardest conversations. You know, and, and I say that because we're in this space right now with everything that we've learned that was right has proven to be wrong. <laughs> you know what I mean? We can tell our kids, if you put up by the police, these are the things you say, these are the things you do. And they've shown us that those things do not matter. So my conversation with my kids being Black in America is fucking hard. I'm sorry to use that language. It's hard. It's hard being Black in America, but also, too, that's our superpower. Our superpower is being Black in America because we're special because we're different. You know what I mean? Like they, you only try to suppress us because you know how great we can be and how great we are. And so I want my kids to know that power. I want my kids to know their heritage. I want my kids to know where they came from because if you know where you come from and where you came from, then you know your power. You know how special we are. So we're going to have all the conversations about everything that's going on in the world and what you can possibly do. But also too, even with those conversations, the world has proven to us that those answers that we give our kids are are wrong, you know? So it, it's, it's hard. It's hard being Black in America. It's simple as that. Dwayne, our theme for tonight is about purposeful life. Have you found your divine purpose in life? And can you share it with us? I, I hope I haven't. Not yet. You know, I'm still young. Well, I'm young in life. You know, at 38, I don't know about about found my divine purpose, but I, I definitely feel that my purpose on this earth, one of my purposes on this earth is to be a father. I think that's my my greatest job. That's my greatest responsibility. That's my toughest responsibility. But I feel that I was put on this earth to be that. I was I was put on this earth to be Zaya Way's father, Zaya Way's father, and so on and so on. Like I knew, I know that that's my purpose. And then do I have other ones? I'm sure I do, but I know that that's the one that fulfills me the most. And I know that that's my important, that's the, my most important position on this earth. Final question, my friend. Speak to our audience about why it's so important to vote, and especially during these times. Yeah, I, I think I've, I've heard people say, and I'm sure you have, it is I don't know who to vote for, or I don't want to vote for either one of them, right? Right, right. The thing is, what people also have to understand is voting is not just about uh, Biden versus Trump. 
is not just about Harris uh, versus Pence, right? Voting is about change from each seat, it, from the bottom to the top. You know, so when you when you go and you go and you go voting, you need to know not just who the president and who's vice president. You need to know all those seats. You need to know all. You, we need to educate ourselves more on those props and those propositions, so we know what to say yes and what we need to say no to. Right. So voting can change bills. Like right? bills can get passed. Uh, things can change by through voting. Right. So we have to make sure that we put the right people in the right seats in the right position of power. And so, once again, it goes back to growing up. We grew up and we, we didn't learn a lot about Black history. We learned a lot about white and American history. And if we learn more about our history and understand who we are and where we come from, and then you understand what's important and why voting is important and how hard it took and how long it took for us to get to this point where we have the ability to vote and have a say-so in this world. So let's not, you know, let's not... Let's not take what our ancestors did and take it in vain. Let's make sure that we take what our ancestors did and we continue to keep building on that. And voting is just one of the things that they fought for for us. And so, um, you know, I think that would be my message to everybody, man, is understanding that it's bigger than you. It's not about you. It's about the ones before you that fought for us to get to this point where we have a say so we have a voice. Let's educate ourselves. Let's understand what it is we want, the change we want to see. And let's go out there and let's make sure that it happens. Dwayne, thank you for joining us tonight as part of our 2020 Blueprints Men Summit. Your voice and the many like yours are so important to the conversation that we have with men. So we wanna thank you for participating and I wish you well. Thank you, man. Everybody, go vote. <laughs>